And I'm Roger Addison, and with, my, with me today is? Rick Rumler. Good. Uh, we'll be your host for this tribute to Gary Rumler. So that I can yeah. actually think about. A, a long string of, of moments. And so for those who don't know me, I am the second of Dr. Geary and Margaret Rumler's three sons uh, and a partner in the Performance Design Lab. So happy to be, uh, uh, have been a part of the last incarnation of, of uh, Geary Rumler's companies. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for coming this afternoon because you represent the people that he was serving for five decades. And uh, so basically, this tribute would not be complete without you being here. Uh, so I greatly appreciate that. Um, I must confess, though, that, that my brothers and my mother and I were occasionally jealous of the time that he spent with you. Uh, but we learned to share the time with you, and we did benefit from the relationships that he had with all of you. So again, thank you for being a part of this, because it's very, very special that, uh, that you're here for this. Uh, I can't tell you how pleased I am with the quality of the presenters we've been able to put together for this afternoon. Uh, what I was using as my gauge for, for the right speakers were people who could really speak to the character and contributions of, of Geary Rumler uh, over his entire career. And I think we've achieved that with, uh, with flying colors. So I look forward to getting a chance to not only you hearing them, but I'm looking forward to hearing the stories that, uh, that they have because we've not rehearsed the stories. So that will be news. But with an, So with an average of three decades of professional and personal association with my father, these folks are going to be able to, to really speak to it. Um, now we've organized the presentations. Ah, the man at work. We've organized the presentations. I think you have to go back to that one slide, because I think everybody remembers Gary always this way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be complete without a, a Gary drawing. Yeah, so exactly. This is, a, this is what I found. Yeah, we were going to use the overhead projector just to really bring back the full five color overlay, you know, and the whole treatment. Absolutely, and only after the tablet PCs came out and you could write on the screen. You still have to have that so. little drawing. You remember that little drawing you had there, the little man? Right there. So what we have for you this afternoon, and we've, we're kind of a little bit into our, into our time, but what we have is a 90-minute is a or 80-minute, as the time is now, a formal presentation where we'd like to present to you. And then we have a 30-minute informal presentation where we'd really love to hear from you what you learned from Geary Rumler. So, so that's what we'd like to try to do. Uh, but the informals, off, I realize we're getting tied up to the dinner hour at that point, so if you can stay, great. We'd, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, but without further ado, I want to get on with the presenters. Uh, the first two presenters are uh, Dr. Karen Searles Breathauer and Dr. Dale Breathauer. Uh, I've literally known both of these fine people since I was knee-high to a performance consultant. <laughs> So without further ado, I'll turn it over to these good people. Thank, Thank you. you, Rick. <laughs> Am I going the right way or the wrong way? You're going the right way. You're sure? Press forward. Press forward. Hmm? Right. Forward button. OK. Aha. Uh -huh. University. Okay, and, and it's this that one. Okay, okay, here we go. Uh, <laughs> this picture of Gary Rumler in 1962 was actually taken in 1965. He might <laughs> have looked younger in 62. He was a 25 year old man from Belding, Michigan. He had engineering credits, and that was an important thing. He had this many engineering credits. That's 90 for those of you who were not counting. He also had a bachelor's degree in management. He had an MBA. He had a growing family. And he was already exhibiting three habits that define much of his career. And those three habits are listed on the slide. You have to base things on science 
manage them from data, and if it doesn't exist, build it, and build a business that pays for it. He was very committed to doing things that benefited both the client and building the technology over time. And then build the technology that assures quality and consistency and service to the clients. Uh, his first three jobs were significant in his development. Uh, the first job was when he was working as a summer intern in an auto plant uh, near Detroit. And he learned that a lot of things happened, people had a lot of ideas about what should be done, and if you wanted to know what was going on, you had to go look yourself, observe, get the data. His second major job, he was working in the Office of Research Administration at the University of Michigan, and he was the project representative for a project called the Audio Lingual Language Programming Project. That is how I met Gary. That project was a project in which we were developing self-instructional material for five different languages. I ended up working on the Thai program. Geary was excited by that experience, and other people were. That experience attracted numerous investors who started the Institute for Behavioral Research and Programmed Instruction. That was Geary's first entrepreneurial experience. He was the assistant director. A man named F. Rand Morton was the senior executive. And that's where I met Gary and Dale, actually. Uh, was in the Institute for Behavioral Research and Program Instruction. Um, and that institute only lasted for one year. And at the end of that one year, um, the part that was making money, there was only one part that was making money, which was the workshop on program instruction, was picked up by one of the uh, managers, well, I think he was on the board of directors, George S. Odiorn in the University of Michigan, and moved to the University of Michigan Business School. Out of that experience of the IBRPI, Institute for Behavioral Research and Program Instruction, two important lessons were learned by Gary, which were that businesses can fail if not managed properly, and secondly, that good products read profitable workshop can survive the death of a business. Uh, Gary established the Center for Program Learning for Business and his work began to be noticed more broadly. Michigan, U.S., and the world. I think I went one slide too far here. Uh, yes, you did, but we're almost ready for that slide. <laughs> but I, I want to uh, tell you a little bit about the start of that workshop. Uh, Geary knew full well, as did his boss, George Odiorn, uh, that they had to beat the competition to make that thing work, which meant that they had to do it better, faster, and cheaper than anybody else could do it. And that was a ex an externally determined design standard. Another thing that I want to tell you about that is a story of how Odiorn actually started the Center for Program Learning for Business. Many of you know the story, but it's worth telling again. Uh, the, when the program learning workshop was going to be offered by the University of Michigan, Odeorn sent out a press release announcing the workshop at the new center. As soon as he did that, he got a call from his boss, the dean of the College of Business, who said, George, you can't do that. You can't start a center that way. It has to go through many, many, many committees to establish a center. And George said, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, what should I do with all the checks? <laughs> and he started reading off names like uh, Michigan Bell, General Motors. I've got to send these checks back. The dean uh, said, okay, George, you've got a center. You've got sales. Let's go. Now, oh my goodness, here we go. <laughs> here we, now we're back to the Karen's favorite slide. Uh, this one is, uh, again, illustrating his commitment to science, also hard work uh, and innovation. 
everything in the, that first workshop was science-based. It was all very carefully engineered. To beat the competition, we had to do it in one week, uh, which means we didn't have time to tell them. All we could do is show them and then help them practice doing it. Uh, we demonstrated analysis, we demonstrated criterion frames, we demonstrated teaching frames, we demonstrated developmental testing, we didn't demonstrate writing objectives. Uh, the, one, uh, the developmental testing uh, generates uh, yet another story, and that story uh, is uh, th about the developmental testing. Uh, there weren't computers in those days, so Geary had to hire a bunch of typists to type the the, the programs on Thursday night so they could be tested on Friday morning. So they were all up late uh, typing the programs. The participants, meanwhile, had an opportunity to go out and experience the nightlife of Ann Arbor. They hadn't had that opportunity because we worked them night and day up until that point. When they came in on Friday morning, they were bleary-eyed rather than bright-eyed. As soon as Geary noticed that problem, he put in a fix. He required them to attend an enrichment session on Thursday night in which we lectured to them on wonderful topics so that the, the next day they could come in and actually developmentally test. And that's a good example of uh, Gary's drive to learn, always, I think, all the speakers will probably attest to that who are up there, are up here today. Um, he learned from looking at what the result was of what had happened. He learned from clients. He learned from colleagues. And the colleagues that he referenced in later years uh, repeatedly were George Odiorn, who Dale has already mentioned, learned moxie, business moxie from him. And the science of behavior and data, he credited George Geis and Dale in uh, teaching him what he could learn about that and what he used out of that. He also paid a lot of attention to what worked and didn't work with clients who attended. So some of the clients uh, that attended are listed here. Those are people who attended the workshops and many of them subsequently did projects. I'm going to go through the programmed instruction workshop to the end of his Michigan years in terms of how he applied that learning. Initially in the program learning workshop, um, people could get results when they went back to their companies and applied whatever the training was that they were applying most of the time. But every once in a while, those results were not achieved. And one of the things that was interesting to Gary, about, uh, about Gary to me, is his curiosity. He was as interested in what did not work as he was in what did work. So he asked that question. If they do it at the end of training, why don't they do it on the job? And that led to the second iteration, which you see here which was looking at what they knew when they came in. In some cases, we discovered we were training them in things they already knew how to do. How valuable is that? Uh, but even more importantly, what does it take to maintain a trained behavior after they leave? And that led to a whole lot of work on the maintenance of behavior. And something that many of you have probably heard and seen and worked with, the balance of consequences what happens when somebody actually engages in this behavior on the job. One of Gary's very powerful quotes, I think, is if you put a good performer in a bad system, the system wins every single time. And that's what the whole designing of what we might call the, the work environment, the management environment, was about. So that led to another workshop and the technology to figure out what did it take for any given behavior. That workshop was the management of behavior change. And once that was in place and people were using it regularly, then we discovered an unintended consequence. So, for example, when sales went up, manufacturing couldn't keep up because manufacturing was calibrated to the level of sales that had been there before. And that meant that you had upset customers. 
uh, an aha moment was looking at through a lens and recognizing that one department, the department, of course, of the person who came to the workshop, uh, was too small a lens. You had to look at the entire system and you had to balance out those consequences. That led to taking general systems theory and looking at the entire organization, but then also the context in which that organization worked, uh, the open systems theory, what are the influences coming in from the outside. And that led to another workshop, the training systems workshop. This idea that you could look at the system level, the process or subsystem level, and the individual performer level was something that continued through all the rest of Gary's uh, work and professional development. Personally, it's probably the most important thing that I took from those years into uh, the rest of my work in change management and talent management as I went on for all the years since. It's still powerful. People still get surprised by it. And that brings us to 1969. There's a lot of information on this slide about things that he had accomplished during uh, those seven years by attending to science and data with his entrepreneurial moxie and creating the technology to do it. Uh, he had earned a degree. He had earned his ed specialist degree. He had not yet quite earned his PhD. He had uh, accomplished a really a very, very great deal that is shown on that slide. And that slide will be available online so that you can look at it and be impressed. Probably you didn't know that he spent a summer uh, teaching at Catholic University. Probably you didn't know that he spent a summer teaching at Harvard University. Uh, there are a lot of things about Gary that you don't know, and you can find them on that slide, and you can find them uh, by listening uh, to the remaining speakers. And at the time that he left the University of Michigan, he was 31 years old. <laughs>